Hey, welcome. We're going to be in Psalm 105 today. Psalm 105, we've been journeying through many psalms over these last several weeks and days. And so as we come to this psalm, I hope you got your journal with you and are, are ready to take some notes and some scripture to write down that can strengthen our prayers uh, as we come to the Lord in our private times. Psalm 105 begins in the first five verses by saying, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done, his miracles and the judgments he uttered. As I was reading through this psalm and thinking and seeing how the psalmist recounts the deeds that God has done toward the people of Israel, I was thinking at times when I go to a closet that up at the top shelf has uh, many of the old games that I uh, played with my brother when I was a, a kid, uh, uh, elementary and middle school. And some of my favorite games are up there. And as I think about this, every once in a while I run into them and I uh, many times I've pulled one of them out of the top shelf just to look at the board and the game pieces. And a lot of memories flood my mind uh, when I do this. And it seems to always lift me up in a positive way. Well, we have covered uh, since March, March 23rd, many psalms, over 100 psalms uh, since March of this year. And, and this is a psalm like a seasoned memory from the past. Kind of like seeing something we've already learned and pulling it off the shelf and looking at it and being renewed in it. Uh, this didactic psalm teaches us nothing new, really, but is a powerful reminder to be diligent in our prayers. The reason we find for this is in the very last verse of the psalm where he says that they might keep his statutes and observe his laws. Praise the Lord. Uh, it, it's all about keeping God's word and observing his word. How forgetful God's people are in many ways. Now, I speak to myself as much as I would speak to anyone else. How forgetful we can be uh, uh, towards, towards God. We are abundantly blessed. We are incredibly graced by the person of God and mightily indwelt by the presence of God within us in Christ. And yet, how often does a day uh, slip by before we realize we haven't even spoken to or even acknowledged God as we moved along our day? How often does a week roll by uh, and we realize we didn't give any real time to meditation or to prayer or to scripture reading? The psalmist writes here, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. We find much of this prayer uh, written out in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. And, and starting about verse 8, uh, we find that it was prayed by the people on a day that David appointed thanksgiving. And this thanksgiving was to be sung to the Lord. He had to appoint a day of thanksgiving. Uh, we have a day of thanksgiving to help us to remember to be thankful but the psalmist is here saying, give thanks to the Lord. It's on a, a, a daily, as we travel, basis. And we see later in First Chronicles, as we travel throughout that book of history, that David tells the people, bless the Lord your God. And then we find the response of the people. And all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to their king. Um, the apostles did much the same for the church. We find them often telling the church to, to pray always and continuously. In Colossians, we read, uh, chapter 4 and verse 2, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. The pattern that I want you to see that is first and foremost is thanksgiving, and then we always read, call upon his name. Thanksgiving, ask God. I love this because Thanksgiving and prayer, 
that thanksgiving and prayer that calls upon his name leads us, leads us in our heart to make known his deeds. It causes us to sing praises to the Lord and telling of his wondrous works to other peoples. Uh, we glory in his holy name and we rejoice in seeking the Lord and, and his strength and, and his presence. We remember the wondrous works that he has done towards us in thanksgiving. Uh, and we remember his miracles. We remember even his judgments. Thanksgiving to the Lord opens our hearts to honor his name. You know, so many times we just dive right into the throne room and start asking of God. And there is nothing of uh, nothing wrong with asking of God. I, I've heard so many people tell me that, you know, Pastor, I don't ask a lot of things for myself because I, I think that's self-centered. Well, I, I think we need to rethink that quite a bit. Uh, first and foremost, I could have never come to Christ in salvation unless I called upon his name in my prayer. Um, I, I could never... I could never wear the armor of God unless I called upon the name of the Lord in prayer and asked for his blessing toward me and his power toward me to wear the armor and to walk in the armor. Um, I, I could never uh, be uh, a Christian man, a Christian dad, a Christian husband. Uh, uh, it's not possible in my earthly flesh. And so without prayer asking God to bless me and to protect me and to guide me and to lead me, uh, then, of course, uh, I'm going to be a weak Christian, if a Christian at all. And, and so we need to be careful that, yes, we need times of prayer asking God to do certain things for us that would glorify his name. Um, so our, our prayers are, are prompted, and, and if I can use this, this earthly word, motivated more, when we begin with thanksgiving of what God has already done toward us, as we remember those things, we're encouraged uh, to ask for more of a very giving, loving Father in heaven. And so Jesus even prayed this example for us. He said, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed, of course, is a totally separate, awesome name. And, and, and in that hallowedness, we give thanksgiving to God. So why then, with all these things being said, why is prayer so often put last or put not at all? Well, at least not until an emergency in our life. Here's what I'm asking. Why is prayer seeming to be the last things, last thing that a Christian always turns to? It's an interesting question to think about. When, when I uh, <clears throat> look at uh, studies that have been done towards the church, and this question comes up, uh, uh, top three reasons come about why people don't pray. And we find the first one uh, mostly is listed that we don't think we have time. We don't think we have time to pray. Um, you know, if it, that's one of the greatest temptations of, of Satan toward us. To convince us that we don't have time. Uh, we are a society, a culture that is constantly going here and there, and we're constantly uh, moving about in, in such busyness that we never take time to rest. We do this with our kids, with our families, uh, with our hobbies, with TV, all kinds of things. And the truth is we do have time. But the real truth is we don't make time. And so we want to be a people who make time. Um, most studies, after saying that we don't have the time, we then uh, realize that we don't think prayer is important. So many don't pray because they don't think that prayer is important to begin with. Um, the third reason that we see uh, in these studies is we don't believe that it makes any difference. Well, I, I, I feel weird just saying those words that a Christian would think that prayer doesn't make any difference. Uh, the last one there, uh, that we don't believe prayer makes any difference, this really comes uh, from having made Jesus someone he is not. Um, what I mean by this is we put an expectation of Jesus that the expectation should have never been there. That's not who Jesus is. Um, for example, Jesus is not a genie in the bottle. Jesus is God. 
And so sometimes our expectation, our, if I can use this word, image of Jesus is completely wrong and in error according to the Word of God. And so that causes us to think that prayers don't make any difference because we're wrongly addressing Jesus in our prayers. We don't think prayer makes any difference because maybe we didn't get what we wanted or we didn't get the answer we felt we needed at the time. And speaking of time, we didn't get the answer when we think we needed it at that time. And so in all those things, we think because God didn't, God won't in prayer. And as Scripture says, and I'm paraphrasing, why should we think our prayer should be answered if we begin with that kind of thinking toward prayer? Why should we think that our prayers would be answered if we've already told God that prayers don't make any difference, that I don't have time for prayers, or that prayer is not important? In logic and reason, we, we know the answer. We shouldn't expect our prayers to be answered if we're going to think that way. So again, if we can put our minds on thanksgiving and call upon his name, giving thanksgiving to God for the great things that he has done and the great things that he has done toward us requires that we first obviously acknowledge the great things. The psalmist here in many verses uh, recounts God's activity to Israel. Israel was the psalmist people, God's people. Um, and he recounted uh, the goodness of God toward them, even when they were rebellious toward God. Um, so the question becomes to the church, to you and to me, do we see the markers of God's grace in our life? Do we see the markers of God's mercy in our life? Uh, do we see the markers of where God has disciplined us because he loves us? And, and as we see those things, do we give God thanks for uh, not only his guidance and the path that he placed us on, but his love toward us. Can we say with the psalmist, as in verse 7 and 8, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Can we be like the psalmist who says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Isaiah the prophet uh, used some of the words of this prayer as he told the people, you will say in that day. He was, he was telling them of a day that was coming in the Lord, and he said, you will call upon his name. In Joel, we read and, and understand that the, the meaning of this prayer, a call upon his name, when in chapter 2, verse 32, he says, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Think about this. Those who call upon the name of the Lord. How do we call upon the name of the Lord? In prayer giving him thanksgiving and calling upon his name. Yes, it refers directly to salvation, the redemption that Jesus Christ has given us on the cross and through his resurrection. But it also talks about salvation from our trials and from our suffering and as we walk through this life. And so <clears throat> our strength is to call upon the name of the Lord. And the calling upon the name of the Lord becomes stronger and stronger, and I believe even with more urgency, as we give thanks unto the Lord. Um, we see the Old Testament prophets encourage the people uh, to, to call upon the name of the Lord. And so as, as we come to Christ and in the New Testament, we see uh, that those who do call upon his name uh, we are answered. Uh, we, we in Christ are the church of God, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. And so those we are those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. What's he saying? We're called together by calling upon the name of the Lord. And so we have a kinship. We have a uh, a brotherhood, a sisterhood. We, ha we are brethren in Christ, purchased with his blood. And this because we call upon the name of the Lord. So we can encourage one another and say to one another, call upon the name of the Lord. You know, back to my story of the games when I was a young, uh, young boy. It it's interesting that when I pull one of those old games out of the closet, even now, uh, it, it brings me a happy memory. Uh, sometimes a smile on my face when I when I think about the 
the disagreements I got into with my brother or something that happened during the game that was funny. It puts a smile on, on my face, and it gives joy to me. But here's the truth. Once it goes back into the closet, the game, once the game goes back into the closet, it is forgotten until the next time I see it. Church, hear me on this. Let us not treat prayer like an old board game in a closet that we bring out once in a while. No, let's, let's be a, a people who pray. Um, let us not be people who don't make time for, for, for prayer. Let us not be the people who don't think prayer is important. And certainly, let us not be the people who fall away and say, prayer doesn't make any difference anyway. Did not Jesus say, ask and it will be done? Did not Jesus say, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? And again, did not Jesus say, and whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. I find that fascinating. He said, whatever. Jesus didn't qualify the whatever. He qualified the condition of prayer, faith. And faith is strengthened as we remember and give thanks to the Lord for the good things that he has done. And so it's an encouragement to our prayer. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. When we are faithless, he is faithful. Let us give thanks so that our hearts literally explode with gratitude to call upon his name again. And as we call upon his name, know with an assurance, he is God who will hear and who will answer. His steadfast love, his faithfulness endures forever. He has cast his favor upon us. Hey, church, may God bless you today. May he keep you and may you have greater understanding as you take this psalm and meditate on its words to give thanks to the Lord and to call upon his name. God bless you.